so uh, it's good to be in Prague. So after being online in Prague, now actually in Prague. So and I keep on coming. So I was here three weeks ago for a conference to give a keynote, and that was like far smaller audience than this. So that's great. So thanks for sticking around. This would be like uh, Dutch dinner time already. So <laughs> yeah, I really appreciate. So I I try to entertain you then. So as Martin already said. Uh, it's about deep neural networks, but it's not going to be that deep. The, the reason being is this uh, keynote from three weeks ago, where I did a sort of what I wanted to do here. And then I promised to some people that were there, if they come back for this talk, that it will not be too close. So then I try to, you know, to refresh and to change a little bit. So this will be a little bit on like AI and side channels, but then the specific uh, topic is going to be more on automated power analysis, leakage evaluation and elimination. And then you see some uh, Sesame Street characters, but that will soon become more clear. So from Elmo to Rosita and Abby. OK, so uh, we're going to start kind of with a gentle introduction and some more about side channel analysis, because I try to kind of get everybody on the same page. I know that uh, maybe not all of you, but maybe some of you have courses with Martin. so and you are teaching about these things, probably. So yeah, but just, you know, for the sake of completeness, uh, we're gonna not assume too much, except some uh, algorithmic knowledge from now previous talk. So as, as you probably were all uh, listening carefully, so I will not need to introduce Zudu at all. So we'll just see some results for side channel analysis of Zudu in a while. Uh, but after introducing some attacks, we're going to also discuss countermeasures and then the actual problem of leakage evaluation, which is indeed uh, an issue for uh, semiconductor companies that have products that require security evaluation, which means a certain uh, certification level against all known attacks. And there we mean typically physical attacks, so, so not those uh, math attacks that were mentioned in previous talk that, that basically, like as, as, as we've seen in the past, like for example of AES in the decades of cryptanalysis, they, they just don't work. So it doesn't get better than it is. So basically exhaustive key search is the best you can do. So that's not the case with physical attacks because here we uh, exploit physics. So the fact that the devices uh, on which AES is running, uh, including other algorithms, are just you know, basically devices that respect semiconductor logic and there are many physical uh, uh, things happening at the same time and actually the fact that implementation um, leak and not algorithms will be more uh, discussion of this talk. Um, so that will be leakage evaluation and as, as Martin said, working several years for industry, um, there you really kind of learn about how crypto is in real world, right? So it's it's not the, the, the crypto of algorithms and math, but it's more like crypto of, that has to do something with physics. So like implementations and side channels. And there very recently, uh, there is a lot of uh, interplay with uh, this, this uh, field of side channel analysis and AI. And again, reasons will become clear once we discuss a bit on what SCA side channel analysis uh, actually does. And then the some, some recent results of uh, some, some co collaborators and my students will be uh, uh, explained in the end. Okay, so it's kind of a long, long story short. Let's start with introduction. So you all know uh, the challenge. So we have all these small devices. And, and now you also know that we have often authenticated encryption running on them and they're on kinds of algorithms such as AES and then more recently uh, permutation-based crypto like Zudu, then also like uh, algorithms like ChaCha and so on and so on. And then the fact that they are kind of really typically implemented on very constrained devices. So devices where you have budgets and sometimes very strict budgets on power, on energy, if they are battery operated, for example, um, on area in general, so memory. So it's it's really like not, uh, not easy to afford expensive crypto there. 
And with expensive, I mean like high performance, but also secure against all known attacks. Because typically, to have secure implementations, you need to add something on top of like simple, like vanilla implementation. Huh? So something we call countermeasures. And, and we'll get there in a minute. I just wanted to kind of motivate this story with all these devices that we, that we use. So, so one thing that makes those devices a target is that not just there are small resources, which would make crypto implemented in a less secure way, because simply you cannot afford much. But the second thing is that they're out there in the wild. So you have these cards communicated with readers or with phones. So like uh, they kind of all the time are engaged in all sorts of communications where basically there is a lot of information that leaks, right? And that leaks in form of timing and in form of uh, power consumption. So if you can measure power consumption on a device while crypto is uh, doing something, computing, there you get some countermeasures, no, sorry, power consumption uh, measurements. And this is like a simple setup that explains how power uh, consumption as a side channel can be measured and later on exploited. Or you can do some fault injection on those devices. Here you see a setup for that with EM. You can also inject spikes in computation such that uh, an error is uh, provoked, which can again lead to breaking the algorithm. Uh, not actually the algorithm, but its implementation. Okay, so these attacks we typically call implementation attacks because, as I said, it's the implementations that leak and not actual algorithms, so not math but physics. And how relevant are they? There are all the time things in the news, so I will just go over a few, so because this was done actually by researchers from Brno, so maybe some of you have heard about it. So it's a bunch of cards, they looked into like Java cards running SSL library, uh, Atmel kind of libraries and so on. And they all turned out to leak timing information that was used to break elliptic curve crypto implemented on those. Uh, then it was a TPM fail where a trusted platform modules were investigated by Intel and uh, ST microelectronics by researchers from uh, uh, WPI in the US. And they found that those uh, TPMs that are actually certified products, so they passed a certain level of security evaluation, you can still find timing leaks that were able to, that were, that were used to, uh, to recover the keys of elliptic curve crypto again. And, and recent one was this Google Titan security key, which is basically using two-factor authentication. And there, uh, researchers from Montpellier to, took uh, this actually secure element, which is the uh, NXP microcontroller, again, certified to a certain level, but uh, maybe five, eight years ago. So uh, the, the, the point here was like that the attack they uh, applied was more like using machine learning and some recent techniques, while you have chips in the field that were certified like almost some 10 years ago, when most of the attacks today were not known. So. There is always like a bit of arms race between the, the uh, people developing chips, so semiconductor companies and also the attackers. So people defending and attacking, it's always like yeah, learning from each other and uh, doing their best, basically. Okay, so, uh, so with SCA, we have this, what we typically call gray box or even white box scenario. So we have a device and that's basically, that crypto is implemented on this device which is typically a microcontroller or FPGA or ASIC uh, in, in, in this sort of gray manner means that it's not a black, black box. So there is additional information uh, becoming available from this kind of implementations. So basically we assume some sort of leakage so the adversary can measure this kind of leakage and learn, say, some information that was kind of completely unintended. So when, when the algorithm was put on a device, then people were not immediately able to foresee everything that will become available once you have it uh, in, as a chip, okay? And the 
the goal of this adversary is not just as in black box crypto, where you only have these pairs of plain text and ciphertext, but you also get some side channel information. And that can be quite devastating. Uh, and even stronger use case is like a white box security evaluator. So those are people in uh, security evaluation labs that get those chips from semiconductor companies and have to certify them secure up to a certain level, like chips from NXP, chips from Intel, and so on. And, and basically, they sometimes get all the details even, so including the code, uh, all microarchitectural information, and so on. And, and even in this situation, they try to, and, and are quite often able to, um, to uh, kind of certify the, 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 the level of resistance some chip has, but then nevertheless, like so, sometime later on, there is an attack that kind of uh, contradicts to what they found. But then again, it's, it's like how it goes, huh? like some, some attacks that are uh, published recently were not known when they were evaluating and so on. So it's kind of not easy. So it's, it's actually a security evaluator uh, assumes to, that the knowledge of almost everything, including those plain text ciphertext pairs, but also uh, all implementation details. And to, 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 to see what side channel analysis adversary can do, we need to be able to model this side channel information. So let's look at the power side channel and how we could model the leakage. So just to, to, to kind of to be able to, to understand how can we actually use this information of on power consumed during certain computation. So this is something that we call Hamming distance model, uh, which counts the number of transitions 0 to 1 and 1 to 0, because as you know, once there is implementation out there, there is chip, so it, it all comes down to zeros and ones, and there is this dynamic power consumption or the switching power that consumes the most of the chip power. And the idea is that if we can measure number of those transitions, we can kind of get a good idea of what overall power consumption is. And of course, it's not perfect. I mean, it's just the model. Models are not supposed to be perfect, but they should work for what we want them to, to do. So let's look at the uh, an example AES implementation on a, a hardware implementation. So we have typically a register holding value, and there is AES circuitry uh, like implementing around. And then you repeat this computation to get the whole encryption. And every time you overwrite the register, right? And every time when you do that, there will be a number of bit, bits flipped, right? From zero to one or one to zero. And you just count, keep the count on those. And that's basically how you get the Hamming distance. And that's how you kind of model the power. Okay. Uh, how does it help with microcontrollers? Well, it's, it's more or less the same. There we have two registers, A and B, and there is CPU computation, and ah, just everything uh, goes over this uh, bus, so microcontroller bus. So a simple assembly instruction that moves register value from A to B, so something like this, move uh, RA to RB, will basically do that over a bus. But the only dif difference here being that a uh, bus is typically set to zero between two cycles. So you basically don't care about previous value. And that brings us to this Hamming weight instead of Hamming distance. So basically, uh, we just do the same. We, because it's all set to zero, we model power consumption as Hamming distance of bus initial value and V0, because V0 is what we want to move from A to B. So this is Hamming weight of V0 X or 0. So this is Hamming weight of 0, OK? So what matters at the moment is Hamming weight and Hamming distance. That's all you should remember. And then, like, the, there is a quite a lot of explanation in uh, what DPA actually does. So that's the, 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 the first and, and still the, the most, the, the best well-known power analysis attack on, on crypto implementations. So, so basically, you, on, on the one side, using the power model and the fact that Power uh, depends on data in, in a way through switching, but still, right? If we can measure number of 
uh, data that's switched, we still get information about the data. And that's, that's the, the, the connection that we basically use to learn the key. Because if we kind of assume that while measuring power on, on the one side and compare it to our power model that we compute based on the known data and key hypothesis, right? Because like take say a byte for a key, key byte huh? that we want to guess. So it's just eight bits. And if you think of ASS box, for example, it gets combined this byte with the plain text byte and then through SBOX, there is output byte, okay? So we take assumption for a key, one for this byte, and we run a number of plain text data, and we, for each plain text, we can compute the output, and we can take then the Hemming weight of this output, right? And that's our predicted computation. And on the other side, we measure power, actual power consumed. And, and you kind of look at the correlation between those two values. And when the correlation is the highest, that's when the key was correct one. So that's, that's all. Just, just kind of very, very hand wavy explained because that's not the goal of this talk, but just that kind of that you understand that due to the fact that power depends on data, we put ourselves in the position by, that by mod modeling power and measuring power consumption and then combining those two, we get to guess the keys that are used. Okay. And then as a result of power analysis of DPA, you have for the correct key graphs like this, where these peaks clearly suggest that it's not just that the key was correct, but it was in these time points that it was manipulated, right? Otherwise, we wouldn't get those peaks in these points. And, and this graph is just for another candidate that's not the correct key. Okay. So this is still the most popular side channel attack can recover secret keys by using a large number of measurements. And um, the same idea is actually used with leakage evaluation methodology, so-called TVLA, which basically used the same principle to find out whether a certain implementation leaks or not. Okay? And that we're going to use as well. Uh, so just to, to kind of detour a bit to look at some setups. So this is a fault injection setup. So we don't talk about that. So, but that's another kind of implementation attack, more active, that is in, inducing some spikes or glitches in computation, trying to provoke a faulty computation. And here you see, yeah, you don't really see, but yeah, it's, it's here is a target. This is a similar board as in the previous slide. Um, this is a Tempest setup. Tempest is well-known side channel uh, attack that basically recovers screen content through EM emanations. And this is set up from our lab, so we were able to read uh, everything that's on the phone without seeing it, just using this Tempest kind of physics feature. Because basically EM is measured through this probe and then there is a connection with a software-defined radio that then reconstructs what's on the phone. So even without seeing, like, our use case for security was when you receive the code, you want to log into a website or something, like for your uh, credit card or I don't know, so then usually you are sent a number, like one-time code to be entered, so this kind of information. And this was kind of nicely um, recovered through this setup. Uh, then this is DPA setup with ARM Cortex M4. This is the same device as here. That's a bit, a bit too dark. You don't see it well. And yeah, just to give you an idea, there is also a special FPGA board for side channel analysis, so called Sakura. Okay. So just to kind of make it more physical, more plastic, more visual. Um, so. When there is attack, there are always countermeasures, and I will try to just maybe say a few words about this before we go to the actual topic with the leakage simulators, but I kind of try to, to have all information ready before starting with that. So the idea is basically to break this link between data and power consumption. So we just established that this link 
as a dynamic power through number of transitions of number of uh, uh, switches basically makes it possible. Uh, so the, the first idea uh, typically referred to as masking is like if the power depends on data, let's then not use the data that is uh, that is supposed to to be kept secret. So that's like given as plain text, but let's like kind of hide it with some other data, because power will still depend on the data, but that's not the data we are trying to hide. So that's another thing. Um, so that's the idea of masking, where you uh, kind of add something to your plain text. For example, you XOR it with some another value, like so-called mask, and then you go through your algorithm, and in the end, you just have to unmask. So yeah, again, you can see already there is overhead coming up because you have to, to, it, to generate masks. They have to be generated randomly, so we don't want bias there. Then you have to do all this computation with a mask, and especially tricky when uh, there are non-linear operations, because if it's linear, you just add a mask, XOR, and then again XOR, get rid of mask. But if it's non-linear, basically it comes down with AES to doubling the S-box computation. So yeah, speaking of resources, uh, doing something with protections, it always adds overhead. So it's becoming even more expensive, okay? Another idea uh, is to you do something called hiding, which basically uh, often involves some additional hardware. So either something that creates a lot of noise because you want the adversary to not be able to do the statistics with many, many power consumption traces that are like nicely aligned, that have the same thing happening at the same time moment and so on and so on. So you kind of try to create more noise. You, you try to make the side channel adversary task more difficult, and then again, that cost. But still, there are always things that the adversary can do, like, for example, go for some signal processing, try again to uh, to kind of unhide the data, to, to remove noise, to if it was misaligned, so that not every time moment is exactly the same for every trace, then you can, you can do realignment, and so on, and so on. So, Whatever you do, there is something that can be done to kind of undo that. But nevertheless, masking uh, became a pretty standard side channel analysis countermeasure. And wherever you look in, in, in real world, there are masked implementations, especially uh, first order. First order we call that defend against first order DPA. Okay? Yes, so, so far we only speak about DPA, so that is first order, but that's, I guess, that's just enough for, for the talk of today. But say, assume we want to, to think of something called higher order DPA, then we would do something that's called uh, deep order Boolean masking, where we share uh, in the following way. So there is a variable D, and then we just write it as an XOR of D plus one shares. And, and now you can immediately see that the adversary that could recover a number of these values Unless uh, all can be recovered, the adversary cannot recover V. Okay, so just complicating uh, the tasks more. And that's where people speak about probing secure scheme and the scheme being deprobing secure if any set of at most D is independent from the whole, from the sensitive value. So basically, if you have all from zero to D minus one, then still there is no way you can, the attack is possible, okay? So to, to have a look at the simple two-share example, with, because that's what defend against the DPA as introduced before. So we just split X as X1, X or X2, and then again, leakage will depend now on the two, but when we compute DPA, we still don't know which one of the two contributes to the measured value, or we can, yeah. We have to come up with something better. So let's say if it's ideally implemented, it should work, but unfortunately, that's just in theory. So in practice, there is often interaction between those values because 
it all again goes on some platform on a chip. There are memory um, elements that are close. It could happen that you write uh, X2 on top of X1, and then you immediately get X leaking and so on and so on. So uh, literature is full of examples where masking is implemented and then you can still, uh, uh, you can still perform a DPA attack just due to all these things that can go wrong. Okay, so like something as perfect implementation is, is very hard to, to expect and, and to get in practice. Okay, and there is also something called glitches that I will not speak about now, but that's basically uh, due to all these uh, signal timing inconsistencies, you, you get something uh, released much sooner than, than, than it should be, and then you immediately get leakage. Okay. So here is an example, say we have a program that processes X and then we have two instructions, one using X1 and X2 and then there is a transition between those two and the bus will leak the hemming distance of those two and that's basically leakage on X. Okay? So knowing all that and starting from the fact that there is leakage evaluation as introduced before, but let me just remind you on what leakage evaluation does. So first, starting from the fact that uh, there is theory and there is practice. And in theory, everything like um, looks as if it should work until it gets to practice, right? So like independent computation basically uh, are each responsible for leakage independently, which means if you have two kinds of computation and you have just one probe or like one, uh, way to measure power consumption, I mean, that's what you do, you ju just do go for one moment, then there is no way you can get both. And that's why the idea of masking works. Because if we say uh, we can measure how one variable is processed, as long as this is the original plain text, we're fine. But the moment we start splitting that, then we need both, okay? A and that's just basically uh, violating the independent leakage assumption. So. Basically, if the adversary can only measure one of those, everything is fine, but that's just hard to obtain because that assumes that you should never get masks that, that are, that you should never have masks close to each other. Not in time, not in space. So we even noticed that when you store them in neighboring registers, that, they, that, that the interaction leaks. So if you, overwrite one mask with another, like one share with another, that's clear that it leaks. But even like spatial uh, microarchitectural effect that are very hard to, to predict and that are very different per architecture, sometimes quite surprised us, like how is it possible that this leaks? Because you, you think you write the code, you know how to do masking, you implement all perfectly, but then there it comes specific microarchitectural feature that basically breaks it all. So that's basically what this talk is all about. So again, there are uh, unpredicted effects like glitches, like distance-based leakage, and that all violate this assumption in practice. Okay, uh, just to remind you again, TVLA, because we use it in these simulators. So that's something that uh, labs came up with as like the first check if certain implementation is leaky or not. And having said it, it's, it's not great. It's far from perfect. It's basically the idea of DPA. Like if you uh, systematically change data and if you take many times random data changed and many times fixed, and if you see the difference between those two tests, two sets, in terms of statistics, like if two sets are statistically different, then there is data power consumption dependency, right? So that's the basic idea behind. And it's of course like very good to have a simple test that will kind of give you an idea. Is there a leakage? Where does it happen? Because you will see TVLA peaks in the same way as we saw DPA peaks on, on certain time points where something was not perfectly implemented, okay? But having uh, 
the, the, the information that there is leakage, we still don't know how exploitable leakage is. It sometimes turns out that you cannot come up with attack that will actually use that leakage. So yeah, it's something that helps, but it's not ideal. Uh, there are false positives and false negatives that we already said. So there is leakage, but it's not exploitable. So it's in a way false positive. Um, and of course, if you have multiple points that it doesn't detect because it's just using Welch t-test. So just basic statistics fixed versus uh, random. Okay. But still, all labs will do that as the first test. So, a small intermezzo on what AI has to do with it. So, just to kind of give you an idea of, like, uh, this whole field was started in the late 90s, and the DPA that I spoke about, and also TVLA, is, is just statistics. So that's the same statistic as, like, as we know, 100 years ago. But... At the same time, now we are 20 something years later, so many things happened in terms of crypto, uh, crypto implementations, computation uh, capabilities. Like in the beginning, when people talked about DPA traces, you would say like million traces, like what? Like, did you take months to record those? Now it's like million traces, no problem. Let's do it in a, like during coffee break. Um, Everything changed in terms of technology, right? We were in like stable micron then, now it's more nano, different power models, different things, so many things. And one of those is also AI, because while statistics seem to be quite okay and sufficient in the beginning, then later on it was like, why not use machine learning? Because basically a lot of those attacks are uh, also kind of supervised learning. And a lot of strategies from machine learning uh, algorithms are very useful for attacks, for countermeasures, and so on and so on. So it was kind of very natural. So first thing uh, that kind of came out was to use PCA, so principal component analysis, for template attacks. Again, template attacks, we're not talking about that today, but those are basically profiling attack and supervised learning. So there you go, PCA. It seems like a match made in heaven. And it was. Huh? It was really improving a lot in that sense. Uh, also, to pre-process. We talked about misaligning traces and stuff like that. So that was also not so convenient. There goes PCA. Uh, machine learning distinguishers. So using those instead of statistical tests. That kind of also worked out well. And then recently also deep learning came in with neural nets for profiling with defeating countermeasures, because you don't, through deep learning, you kind of ignore certain effects. Actually, your training is able to undo those effects. So some countermeasures were like, they were never there. Tempest-like techniques, I showed you the example that what we did with the phone, that was basically neural net that recovered the information, those digits on the screen. And the, the last thing is what I want to talk about today. So how does that help with leakage assessment? And before that, just to also kind of support this with a number of papers on AI for side channel analysis. So you see it started a bit kind of shy, 2009, one paper, one paper, but look at the last few years. And this is just until, uh, not uh, this is not updated, so it's just, Certainly for 21, but maybe more, okay? So, what is the motivation to do this? So, as we notice, uh, side channel attacks are a big thing. I, I hope you are now convinced about that. And that's because, like this Google Titan, uh, right? This, that was last year broken. That was the most recent chip of Google. And then a few guys from a lab in Montpellier take it and, and they break it within a few months. Then comes another question like, how can that help in real-world application if it takes them two months to break it? But let's just say that just doesn't matter because people become still quite nervous if you can get the keys out of the chips that are in the field, okay? And we leave to the adversary to come up with use cases. So it's just not nice. So uh, what is also not nice is that you typically do all kinds of tests and side channel analysis and TVLA uh, 
in like this pre-silicon stage, right? So you test your code, you do all kinds of those checks, because making a chip and only then testing is a bit too late. But but nevertheless, even uh, even if you if you do it all in advance, it can still be too late because having the code that just doesn't take uh, microarchitectural effects into account is just not a complete picture. So, kind of thinking about all that, people started thinking about something called leakage emulators or simulators or whatever you want to call them. So, say tools that could already take into account what architecture will the code be running on and try to evaluate all corner cases, all possibility, and, and find whether it's going to leak, and if so, what we can do to prevent it before it's too late. Okay? And that's something that's, that's very nice for companies, of course, because every chip that's, that's break, broken later on is kind of, yeah, cost a lot of money to fix. And uh, yeah, they have to have to pay a lot of money to those evaluation labs anyway, but now even, even worse, right? And that's how it all started. And then the idea was, okay, we can basically easily do that because we have, we have the code, we have TVLA. It's not perfect, but it works, so let's do that. And the, there are the different ideas that were around. So, of course, the most accurate is SPICE. But as, as you might know, if you are doing electrical engineering, SPICE is great, but it's just not so efficient, especially like with crypto, with complexity of crypto and intensity. And you cannot get the whole circuit. It's usually just a small pieces and so on. And it's just not meant for tight channel attack. So it's just a different concept behind. Um, then, uh, okay, we have to do something new, but then do we just look at the source code, which is platform independent or uh, machine instruction level, keeping a specific CPU. And there are of course advantages and disadvantages for both, but I'm just trying to kind of bring in uh, kind of everything that was considered until now. And the, the first one, and that I want to speak a bit more about, is ELMO, which is instruction level emulator, that basically did all that with power consumption traces used to, to kind of profile all the instructions, taking a set of instructions that are typically used in crypto, and then spending a few months on training, and learning how which instruction leak and trying to find out uh, how would that all work on keeping in mind one specific architecture, which is ARM Cortex M0. So this is again this kind of bottleneck in like, okay, if you have a specific CPU in mind, you can be very precise and you can use all these instructions and everything, but then everything you did will not easily be reused on another architecture. So that's, that's the only problem here. There are other um, uh, proposals. I will not now speak about that. Maybe not so important, but just like for your information, if you're interested, we can discuss it later on. So that's, that's where we came in with the idea, okay, if Elmo already does that. So Elmo is the tool that identifies all leaky points. Yeah, for now, it's magic. Like... Uh, we'll, we'll talk a bit about that, but I already kind of hinted that they used months and profiling of, of different instructions and, and say as a training uh, stage. And then after, after that, they were able to then running the code, identifying those instructions. They were also kind of grouped and partitioned. Then you see exactly how given implementation leaks. Okay. So, if we can put something on top of that, that will now fix the leakage. So that's kind of additional tool. By rewriting the code, especially focusing on those points that were leaky or identified as leaky, and then coming up with another implementations that reduce this leakage, and then basically repeating those two steps as, as long as it takes, then you come up with a code that's fixed against side channel leaks, okay? And that's what Rosita did, and uh, the paper is here. So I, I, I didn't, like, in Johan in previous talk, listed all these people on the first slide because it, it wouldn't fit. I will, I will have a 
few more uh, papers, so then you will see all the co-authors and the students and, and everybody who actually worked on this. So, here is the, the paper summer, paper, the slide summarizing what Elmo did. So, they take 21 instructions by basically saying, okay, all the, this is in, enough to cover most of the symmetric ciphers used. Um, and then they divided them into groups based on the leakage, on leakage profiles, and then use these power traces to, uh, to do this profiling stage. And then each trace was processed by selecting points of interest as representative of the whole trace. So it's kind of a long story. I mean, you have to read the paper and they just use linear regression on the data to find the coefficient and then basically they model it as a linear combination. The only drawback, like a great work, uh, first one uh, of this kind, but just the, the, the main drawback is just one architecture. Okay, so you cannot reuse anything for say, Uncortex-M4 or M3. That's a pity. Okay. Then uh, what we started looking into with Rosita, we noticed that some um, leakage cannot be fixed which can only mean one thing, that ELMO doesn't cover really everything. So yeah, it, it's always like that. I mean, usually emulators and simulator tools are kind of, yeah, just, you know, simulations, not, not perfect reality. So there is always like a number of assumptions that are representing your model. And unless you really take everything into account, which is hardly possible, uh, yeah, you end up with something like this. So basically, we first extended those missing bits with something called ELMO star. And the, the main thing was to look at the combination of bits across the two operands of an instruction. Okay? So I will, I will explain on an example. And then we introduced the concept of dominating instructions. So all instruction in pairs have a certain kind of behavior that one of them typically dominates the other. And unless you separate them in like in code or in, in terms of storage, you get undesirable leakage effects. And example, uh, so that, that's, what, that's what I just said. So this is an example. So this code checks how store and EOR are interacting in this sense. We want to see if store dominates yours, which is the uh, bitwise XOR. This is this one stores the, the address on which R2 is to R1. So by checking this, we put store in first and, and the ninth step, and this one is in the middle. And if this one dominates, there will be leakage at line nine. Okay? So you just look at the power consumption trace, and if there is a presence of leakage, then you see that this one dominates the other one. And we did it for all pairs of instructions. So we kind of just tried to add additional information to our simulator that would take care of those undetected leakages, right? And, and that was necessary because the first version of Rosita tool could not fix all the leakage. And then Elmo Star added this. So these interact, in, this interacting things in between. So you can see wherever triangles points, this one dominates. So say pop dominates ARs. Uh, I don't know, you can see it all. Which one dominates, which so it's basically symmetric. And there is a circle we see that is basically interacting on the same storage, okay? And now how to identify the leakage cause more practically, that's very close to the ELMO idea. So this is linear regression uh, model that notice here that there is very high voltage at this load instruction. And in particular, variable two is contributing to it. So how can we fix that? So we look at the code and we try to separate those instructions. You see here, this is the problem. This is 50 and all these are much smaller. So we have to s reduce this. And we, in, in, we insert another instruction, dummy instruction. So this just moves something R7 to R7, basically nothing. But it separates further 
the instructions in code that were normally otherwise interacting because one of them is dominating the other, okay? And just by inserting this, it's a sort of really like dummy fix, we get here suddenly zero instead of 50, okay? So those are very, very simple fixes and that's all that Rosita does. This is the setup. You see the picoscope, the usual stuff, and discovery board with the uh, ARM Cortex M0. So the same microprocessor as um, Elmo, because Elmo was our starting point. And these are the results of TVLA, so to find leakage. And now forget about that it's not perfect. Like, like I said, that's the best we have. So this is AES original before fixing. You see that if it goes above and under those red lines, that means leakage, okay? So here you see obviously leakage, and this is fixed with Rosita. It stays within those lines. This is Zudu. Great, now you know what Zudu does. <laughs> uh, otherwise, it would be like, okay, Zudu is this and that, okay. Ah, so you see leaks everywhere until it's fixed with Rosita, then it stays within. Same for Chacha. This is not fixed completely. So whatever we did, Chacha was very hard on fixing. And probably the reason being is that this is it's a very special cipher. It's arcs. So it's not like um, easy to mask. So those are really like very tricky. I, I know that even a paper that um, implemented masking for Chacha was published at Chess, which is the top venue in crypto hardware and embedded systems basically suggesting that it is a challenge even to mask it, okay? And what is important is how much it costs to fix it. And here you can see uh, the numbers. So for Chacha was 61% overhead. Again, and we didn't even fix all the points. Uh, but for AES and Zudu was much better, just less than 20% in both cases, 18% and 15% for, uh, so Zudu is 18, AES is 15. And you see uh, abs like the absolute values in cycles. So this is penalty in cycles because we were forced to kind of do these tricks with adding some additional instruction to, to kind of separate those leaky points, okay? So that's the idea behind uh, Rosita. This is comparison with the real traces to after doing what, what we did with the tool, we also verified that this indeed fixed implementation. And, and you can see that again, uh, Chacha original and fixed somehow remain stubbornly a bit down. So not was, was not so easy to fix. While AES and Zudu, this was just very clearly improvement in terms of leakage reduction. Um, more numerical results. So this is the number of cycles that I already uh, had on the slide before. But this is, you can see in terms of leakage points before the tool um, fixing it. So we had, Chacha had 238 leaky points. And after several runs of Rosita, we still have one that was never fixed. And pff, it will never be probably so, so hard to, because yeah, we even, we're adding new things in the model and still never able to fix this one. Uh, but yeah, maybe not even exploitable, but nevertheless, it's kind of not nice. Huh? You wanna submit a paper and then you have like something was not fixed. Yeah, great, so go back and figure out, go figure. Anyway, um, to summarize, uh, what we did was to fix this first order leakage. And um, to do that, we had to take the best known simulator to kind of upgrade it a bit to Elmo Star, and then um, only then use new tool to for as, as code rewrite engine to fix it. Um, so we you saw that I, even after million of traces, uh, that was all okay for AES and Zudu was still not perfect for Chacha, but okay, it was kind of quite good. And in this way, we were able to automatically protect mast implementation with 20% overhead, I mean, less than that. What's important, I, I don't know if I mentioned that specifically, all these implementations were masked. 
which means there should be, in theory, no first order leakage. And yet, this is all leakage that we got, so all these points. That just again to, to remind you on this statement how masking works in theory, right? So, mask implementation in practice, you break with DPA almost on daily basis because of all these microarchitectural interactions. Because, like, you mask an algorithm, right? You don't mask it when thinking of when it, where it will run. And then all kinds of new things coming up. Okay. And to, to make up for uh, my promise, I will use just five minutes more with, uh, to do something with AI, but just to also kind of advertise a bit that we also extended Rosita on higher order, that's Rosita++. Plus Plus. And there were some other ideas to improve on TVLA part, to not use TVLA, but some other uh, better tests. So the question remained, because we still were just taking care of our cortex M0. Can we do something that's more generic? And that's something that we are doing at the moment. So the question, the research question for, for us was, can we automate the creation of fine grain leakage models without reverse engineering the microarchitecture? So can we do something that would hold for more than just one platform? And then the new tool came out called Abby, which basically using deep learning to automate this process. And kind of Elmo being our benchmark, we already see that we can do as good as Elmo, but now the, the goal is to move to other platforms. And that I will just try to convince you quickly about. So this is Abby versus Elmo in terms of modeling. These are instructions, so preceding, current, and the next. So you just see how much more complex ELMO model is, which is good. Complex is good, it's more precise. But at the moment, we don't want too precise. We want generic, okay? So for us, challenge was whether by ignoring all these things that ELMO does and use some machine learning, can we still come up with kind of decent simulator? And it, so we added a few things. Uh, this is the uh, multi-layer perceptron was used for this modeling part. So basically, uh, this is what it does. So the, 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 the short, the, 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 the workaround of, on Abby is much shorter than Elmo because basically you have to do your data set generation used on all these things as, as required by the MLP structure. So yeah, it at the end is completely automatic because it only has just these two data steps and the results are almost as good as Elmo. And this is the, uh, the left one is for Zudu, the right one is for ByteMask Day, yes. So you can see that we identify the same leakage points as Elmo, but it's just maybe uh, not so prominent, but and again, Elmo is much more refined and taking ARM Cortex M0 specific features that we try to ignore because we want this to hold also for M3 and hopefully M4 and so on to come up with something generic. So these are first results. It looks quite okay. Uh, leakage simulators are a big thing. This slide is just to convince you about this. So these are pre-silicon, post-silicon. You can see just in 21, there were six proposed and they keep on coming, so that seems like something that um, people can do quite some research on. And uh, with this, I would like to conclude that um, with side channels evaluation, there is a lot to, to do, and there is a lot of work on for evaluators and uh, anything that can help in terms of kind of, you know, doing things while it's not too late is useful because once chip is, is, is taped out, and then finding leakage, yeah, that's just too late. Um, that is active, that I said. Uh, Rosita, uh, we, we saw basically the idea to remove the leakage, and we also verified it on real hardware, and you saw that fixes are quite affordable. And Abby is something that does um, something automatically, and Rosita and Rosita++ Plus Plus, uh, were kind of really just, say, thriving on this idea of Elmo. So if you're interested, there are papers on Rosita and Rosita++. Plus Plus. 
and Abby is just still work in progress but yeah we hope it gets better also eventually everything gets better with time so we hope for that too and I'm ready for questions now so thanks for your attention so thank you so questions yes yes thank you uh, I hope my question is not too silly and I hope that Martin won't feel offended because uh, it's been some time that I had to his uh, subject. Don't actually CPUs, when they run the instructions, don't they optimize, don't they reorder the instructions after maybe Rosita has added something to that uh, code, just rewritten the code, and then at the runtime, can it happen that the instructions run in a different order and therefore a leakage can occur even though the original assembly code was like fixed. Mm. Are you asking if they do that or should they do that? Um. <laughs> <laughs> but, but for Is it an issue? Ask, That's the question. I don't know. <laughs> Whether your attack works e even if they use reordering a ring of instructions, maybe. It was, was that the question? Or? Ah, <laughs> like that. If they are some uh, assembly language, if, the, if, if it no, makes yeah, some it, optimizations. <laughs> No idea. Could it be? Is it done kind of randomly or out of order execution? Completely not in the scope. That's that's really like uh, not so not crypto kind of stuff. So <laughs> that's 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 just you know general CPUs. Yeah? They their performance is, is is the big thing, and, and crypto is never done with performance in mind. They really have kind of security consideration. So there you will never do out of order execution. So well, uh, it's just too crazy. Yeah? I would just like comment on that question that like uh, side channel analysis is much easier on like a processor from a smart car that runs, I don't know, like 100 kilohertz mm -hmm. insertion cycles per second uh, compared to like a eight core desktop CPU that runs at four gigahertz. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, you are you are you are interested in these like small processors yeah. that run at slow, at low, low, low frequencies. So each each like switch or the, or the transition is like visible. Yes. Like modern processors have like billions of transistors, and you can't can't see anything in in that. Yeah. So Although they do, uh, maybe not power, but their timing is quite often an issue still. But. Yeah, that's why I start with this slide with small devices, right? I mean, we have them and we need them and they are constrained. So there you will not run Intel CPU with eight cores. Huh? So, yeah. yeah, actually interesting was is a mobile phone who was 10 years ago still considered like this constrained device, but now it's like yeah, super powerful. So that's out of scope now. <clears throat> So thank you very much for the presentation. I just like to ask about the Abbey. It's the promise that we will have the simulators for all small processes. Yes. That's the vision. Yeah, I, I, I should be careful because I'm on yeah. camera. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> what I say. Yes, that's the hope. Huh? So. Yeah, and, and the second one is, uh, are the manufacturers doing these processors, caring about leakages like that, like uh, for Crypto processors they do, but but the ordinary, uh, let's say for general use processors, yes. do yes. they care? And maybe do they care because of the cryptographic leakages or some other issues that this is causing? Yes, they do. So those are called secure microcontrollers, but they are still like starting from say uh, something from ARM or you know from NXP, and then you have uh, that they ask for their own instruction set and so on. But but the Titan chip is just NXP chip that sits in many java cards so that's that's microcontroller so yeah they they kind of uh personalize them in a way each company and make them what they call secure microcontroller but yeah there you still have all these issues so i think yes yeah, other questions thank you for your presentation uh Considering the pairs of dominating instructions, mm -hmm. uh, am I right that uh, those are just uh, experimental results? Yes. And uh, are there any lectures taken from the results? Do you see anything in, inside that? Uh, 
yeah, yeah, we see all these things. So this 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 whole table was made of, based on those experiments. Yeah, just experiments, but nevertheless, no, that was just to kind of refine the model further to be able to to fix it faster. So when we know which which pairs are kind of behaving in dominating way, then you also kind of give the Rosita strategy how to deal with them in that sense, because that was not, that was missing in Elmo before. Because when they int interact on the same storage, that that's where the problem comes, because then one dominates the other and they reuse the same storage. So that's, that's the thing. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes, there is one question. And maybe just the, 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 the question you said with, with coprocessors. So I, I, I would say definitely coprocessors suggest that that's crypto. So that's much more secure than when software running on something. But I still think the main reason that we have them is to support public key crypto, right? Otherwise, you cannot get those on microcontrollers. But nevertheless, yeah, the fact that it's in hardware makes it also more secure. So yeah, sure. Okay, so my question is, you talked about the Rosita++, Plus Plus, yes. which uh, takes care of the higher order leakage. Yes. That means multivariate leakage, yes. right? Yes. Uh, uh, what's the computing complexity? Is it still feasible on a real world crypto? Uh -huh. uh, you mean complexity of the uh, evaluation in, in terms of TVLA? Yeah, we, we had to do quite some uh, kind of shortcuts in terms of ignoring many, many points or so reducing uh, points of interest to just one and then looking at like there was this G-square, there is multivariate TVLA, there are all kinds of ideas and asking advice from data scientists, which would be kind of a way to, to have these algorithms running more efficiently. So yeah, we kind of, yeah, we've been there. Uh, it's it's definitely, it, it looked like it's never going to work. And even now we only went to the uh, order three. Uh, because we said, okay, we just do second, and we argue that's what um, real, uh, that's what companies do, that's what real world secure is. But then uh, reviewers came back and said, oh, can't you do higher? Is it all what you can do? So then we're actually then forced to do also order free, and and that was really the, the, the challenge. Yes, yes, very good point. Yes. Olympic microphone. <laughs> So thank you. And I would like to ask, wouldn't it be possible with better resolution and lower noise floor to get some results even from the uh, like changed code by Rosetta? Aren't you worried about that? Like, I mean, after you run your uh, Rosetta on your code and you get the result of obfuscated, like so you don't have any leakages yep. with like uh, at, at least according to TVLA, yeah, but uh, it could be there is still leakage, yeah? Yeah, so like if you were able to get a better resolution, wouldn't you be able to find some patterns once again? Could be, but we didn't try. But what would you suggest then? And I would like to ask as well, uh, are you able to optimize for performance with Rosetta and for the noise floor? I mean, like so we could choose if you want a better noise floor or better performance of the code. So it's, since it's fixing, we don't care about better performance there. We just care about really having low overhead, so fixed implementation that is not that, that expensive. Yeah, all right. Thank you very and, much. And, and the, the code, if it's two, two hours or five hours, well, that's all fine. No? Okay, other questions? Somebody wants Olympic microphone? <laughs> Okay, I have the questions uh, at the end of the of this of the other presentation. You had the slide with the simulators, and there were some pre, pre silicon and post silicon yes, simulator. Yes, what, yes. what does that mean? Post silicon mean, means that it is gallium uh, gallium arsenate or, or something like that, or that is uh, another material. Uh, pre silicon, post silicon. It was at the end of the. Ah, maybe this one is switched off. No, 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 no. It, mm. Sorry. It no, it should working. work. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. There was chart. Mm -hmm. This one, yes. yes. Yeah, so prelicon versus post silicon. Yeah, what what's what's the difference? Yeah, pre silicon is just where you have the code. So with uh, ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. 
before the dye is done. And, and with yeah, post silicon, okay. yeah, that's that's much more realistic. But then you already had to prototype to, to do that. So actual measurements. Yeah, yeah, okay. so. I, I got it. Thank yeah, you. Sure. <laughs> so other questions? No. So thank you again. Thank you very much again. Thank you.